or anyone who might like to use one. Uh, there's these sheets at the back. I think most of the children and young people have got one just to help you follow through both the service and also uh, some of the, the talk as well. So do you grab one of those if you would like one? Well, today uh, we're carrying on our journey through Ephesians, uh, learning all about God's big plan of salvation. Uh, but first, we're going to start off with a bit of a quiz. Those who might be getting to know me will not be surprised by this. I do like a good quiz. So, I'm going to show you some pictures from some kind of epic adventure series, and I want you to tell me uh, which ones they're from. Okay? So, first one. Any, any guesses? Narnia. I think you should shout Narnia. Yeah, there's a, there's a lion there. Yeah, very good. That's Chronicles of Narnia. How about this one? I think some people who should be in the know on this already anyway at the back, but any, any, any other takers? So there's a wizard at the front, I'm going to give a clue. I hear, I hear some strong, strong shouts of Lord of the Rings from the back, so yeah, there's some, and then, how about that one? Oh, yeah, I hear some shouts of Harry Potter. Very good, very good, very impressive knowledge there. Well, maybe uh, not all of those are your cup of tea, uh, but there's no denying when we look at the world around us uh, that people love these kinds of adventures. I, I love these kinds of adventures, to be honest. Uh, adventures where a whole world is created to tell a grand story of heroic deeds, uh, of evil villains, and, and of good triumphing over evil in the end. Uh, but the great thing about these stories is that, that we don't just read them, we, we live them. We want to be part of them. Uh, that's why our dressing up box at home is full of superhero costumes to act out. It's what leads children to race around the garden with toy swords yelling, for Narnia! Uh, it's why there are endless toys and games to help us enter into those kinds of stories. Well, maybe you're sat there thinking, well, sure, that's true for children, but, but don't we grow out of it? Well, perhaps, uh, but I wonder if we don't just find different stories uh, to live by, to be part of, as we grow older. Uh, whether it's uh, following a football club, uh, or political involvement, uh, or climate change activism. Uh, these all offer us uh, a bigger story to be part of. Because what these stories offer us is the chance to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Uh, it gives us a cause worth fighting for, uh, a goal worth pursuing. Uh, well, what am I getting at with this? Well, well to put it simply, Maybe this desire, this longing to be part of a bigger story, is no accident, uh, but it's part of how God has made us. Uh, maybe God gives us this longing because he longs for us to find our place in his story. And it's this story, God's big story, that's the focus of our passage from Ephesians today. So as we arrive at Ephesians chapter 3, well, Paul's already said quite a lot about God's big plan for his people in the first two chapters, as we've heard in recent weeks. So as we start chapter 3, uh, verse 1, it looks like Paul is about to move on, but then he sort of suddenly breaks off mid-sentence. You'll notice there the, the dash in the text there. He just sort of breaks off what he's saying. Uh, because he realises there's something else that he needs to tell them, something else to explain. Well, uh, what more is there to say, you might think? Uh, well, there's two things he wants to make clear for his readers. And these two are the mystery God has revealed and the big story God is telling. There's a mystery revealed and a story being told. And those are the two big ideas we're going to have a think about together now. So let's start with this mystery, shall we? Because uh, it's clearly on Paul's mind here. Uh, we see it in verses 3 and 4, 
and six and nine. Uh, and there's lots of kind of things we could mean by the word mystery. Uh, but what Paul's getting at here is, is something that only God knows. And the only way to find out is if God reveals it to us, if he tells it to us. God is like the master storyteller, and he knows just the right time to move on, to let us know the next part of the story he's telling. Because at this point, uh, as Paul's writing, or a bit before that, at, at this point, the big mystery here, going into the New Testament, the question on everyone's lips was, how was God going to save his people? And uh, not just the Jewish people, but people from all nations. You see, this goes right back uh, to God's promises to Abraham, uh, the promises of blessing, uh, not just for Abraham and his descendants, but for all nations. Uh, looking at verse 5, we see that Paul says this, this mystery, it wasn't revealed to past generations. Uh, so when we read the Old Testament, uh, sure, we have lots of hints and lots of hope-filled imagery, uh, like those we heard in our reading from Isaiah just now, uh, a talk of a rich banquet for all nations on God's holy mountain. It sounds fantastic, doesn't it? But, but we don't quite have the full picture in view. It's like it's not quite in focus, because it's not quite clear how God is going to do this, how he's going to achieve it. How will he bring this blessing to all nations? But now, Paul says, all that uncertainty has been blown away. With the coming of Christ, it's like the curtain has been pulled back, the floodlight switched on, the camera brought into focus. And we see the full picture for the first time. And the picture is Jesus. It's, it's the mystery of Christ. Paul calls it the mystery of Christ because Jesus is the answer to that mystery at the heart of God's story. It's how God is going to bring that blessing to all people. It's who Jesus is. It's what he's done. Now, all those things we've been hearing about over recent weeks as we've worked our way uh, through this letter so far. Uh, but also, as this mystery is revealed, well, suddenly we can look back and we can see the Old Testament more clearly in its light. So we can then we can now rejoice that all that was promised then is now open to people of all nations because of Christ. And so that is God's great mystery, all revealed in God's perfect timing. So that's the, the mystery and how that's been revealed. Uh, let's turn now to think about the story that God is telling and the part that God has for us in it. Uh, and to do that, there's another big word that Paul uses in verses 2 and 9. And that word is administration. Ah, maybe that's not the word you're expecting. I have to confess, the word administration does not naturally fill me with joy. It, it makes me think of all the emails I need to reply to. That is a live shot of, uh, of my email inbox from last night. Uh, <laughs> a lot of them are quite old. Uh, or the, maybe the steady, steady, steadily growing piles of paperwork around my study. Uh, but that's not, that's not the kind of administration that Paul is talking about here. Uh, no, he's using it in a different way. If you listen to, to people talk about the US government, you'll often talk, hear them talk about the administration. So at the moment, they might talk about the Biden administration. Uh, and they basically mean uh, the people in charge who are putting their plans into practice. Uh, and that's much more like Paul's thinking here. It's, it's the God administration, if you like. It's God's strategy for salvation, his master plan. It's the script for the story that God is weaving through all of human history, uh, letting the whole world know about this mystery 
that has been revealed. And Paul has a part to play in this, and so do you and I. Uh, You see, Paul knows how utterly incredible it is uh, for God to include him in this story. Uh, He calls himself less than the least. If you think about it, that doesn't make sense. You can't really be less than the least. He invents a word to say it because he knows uh, how unworthy he was. He used to hate Christians. He used to hate the name of Jesus. And then one day... Uh, As he went along to arrest and kill more Christians, boom, Jesus appears to him and his life is transformed. And so if God could use someone like that, who was on his way to oppress God's people, uh, well, there's (coughs) no one who can't be given a part to play. So what was Paul's task? What role did God have for him? Uh, See there at the end of verse 8 and going into verse 9, he's called to do two things in particular. uh, To preach and to make things plain, to explain things. Uh, Paul's preaching was was particularly to the Gentiles, those outside of of, of, uh, Paul's own people, the Jews. Uh, His preaching preaching was to, to tell them the limitless, boundless, unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, the wonders of the great mystery that has now been revealed. Uh, But focusing on the second one, the Greek word that that Paul used, used, that's translated make plain here in verse 9, it means really to to shine a light on. See, shining a light helps bring hidden things into the light. Uh, Not like an electric torch that sort of switches on and off again, but perhaps more like a lamp or a candle that's, that's once lit helps us to illuminate what's around it. And, what's, and for us, it means it's helping us to see how our life stories fit into God's bigger story. Uh, and praise God for how he used Paul to do this, that 2,000 years later, God is using the letter Paul wrote to the Ephesians to help bring things to light for us. And see, this, this calling, it wasn't just for Paul. No, God's big story didn't stop them. No, he's still at work today, calling us today to tell people about the riches of Christ, all he's done, to help bring the light of God's truth into people's lives. And so how is God doing this today? Is it through sort of big names and heroes? Well, not for the most part, no. Uh, look down at verse 10. It says it's through the church that God's wisdom is made known. The church, you might say. Really? That's God's plan? To work through something as seemingly ordinary and mundane as the church? Yes. Local churches, uh, groups of people just like us, uh, are at the heart of telling God's story in the world today. Uh, Think back to one of the epic tales we thought about earlier. If you know the story, in The Lord of the Rings, it wasn't the mighty warriors who ultimately won the day. It was the the humble, ordinary hobbits uh, who pressed on and kept going even though things got tough. And perhaps that's what we're called to do as well, to to keep pressing on, to keep finding ways uh, to tell that story, uh, to shine that light. So we've thought about the mystery revealed uh, and the story that God is telling. Uh, But how do we do this? What what does this actually look like? Uh, Because it's not mainly about uh, great acts of bravery and courage although there have been many, many of those through the history of God's people, and we can look to those and be inspired by them. Uh, But for the most part, for you and for me, it's worked out just in the ordinary, everyday ways of being God's people. Uh, And one of these ways is by reading and studying and teaching and preaching God's words in the Bible, uh, where the mystery is revealed where the story is set out. Uh, 
there's a scene in one of the Narnia books, uh, Prince Caspian, where the main characters, they, they rediscover a long lost treasure chamber. Uh, it's pitch black and all they have is a torch to shine around the room. But as they go in and they, and they shine it round, they discover the riches of the vast treasure that they found. And that's really what we're trying to do as we come to engage with the Bible. Uh, we're shining a light uh, to reveal some of God's treasure room. That might look like reading a Bible story to a toddler, or meeting with a few others to, to look at a Bible passage together over coffee, or, or listening to an audio Bible on your commute to work or while doing the washing up or praying for someone who's sick or struggling with life, perhaps sharing a verse that's encouraged you recently. Uh, the point is, these are, these are fairly ordinary, everyday things. N not always easy, and not without sacrifice. But I'll bet all of those have happened in the life of our church this past week. Uh, and what's really remarkable is, is that in God's sight, these things, they're anything but ordinary. Uh, as God uses those, and he weaves them all into the bigger story that he is telling. Uh, because just meeting together today, it might feel quite normal. Uh, maybe, maybe small and insignificant compared to all that's going on in the world around us. But verse 10 actually gives us a glimpse into a deeper reality. Uh, that, our, that our meeting together here today as a church in Stanton by Dale... It echoes in the heavenly realms. Because uh, as we meet and pray and sing and speak of all that God has done and is doing, well, the wisdom of his plan shines out, even if we can't see the full reality yet. Because as we, as we meet here today, uh, so too do hundreds of thousands of others across this land and hundreds of millions more around the world come together to celebrate Jesus, the centre of that great mystery now revealed, meeting to encourage each other to, to keep on pressing on in good times and bad. Oh, what a privilege it is then to be able to play our part in that bigger story uh, that God is telling. Uh, so why don't I pray for us now uh, before we come to stand to declare our faith together. Why don't I pray for us now? Lord God, we thank you so much uh, for the privilege of being part of your people, of uh, being part of the story that you are weaving through all of human history. And though we cannot see the full picture yet, we thank you uh, for the privilege of being part of it. Thank you, thank you most of all uh, for the mystery revealed in the Lord Jesus, of how you have brought blessing uh, to all nations through him, bringing us together as one people in him. We thank you so much for your grace uh, to us in doing this, and your grace that sustains us each day. Amen. Amen. Thanks, bro.